there have been teams down throughout history that get tagged for being, I don't know, next year's champions or paper champions. I got to think this Texas A&M football program is the most talked about college football team in the nation during the off season. So we'll see what does uh, coming up here in 2022. Of course, we got uh, Andrew Hattersley on the line. We got uh, Texas A&M football talk with all of you live and kind of an inside joke between Andrew and I would be that uh, finally I got the SEC, uh, yep. the Texas A&M channel up and fired up and running with the live stream. That's just been a bear to get done, but it's done. Yeah. So we're simulcasting on the main channel, the SEC channel, the Texas A&M channel. So if you love the Aggies, get on over, support our Texas A&M channel. And you know what? If you just love what we do here at the Voice of College Football and you don't like Texas A&M, Still go over there, please, and subscribe until we get to a thousand subscribers. That's kind of the magic mark when it comes to YouTube. All right, Andrew, how you doing today? Yeah, I bet I bet there's plenty of A and M fans out there, right? There's no, there, there's they've uh, there's never a dull off season around Texas A and M, and and this has certainly been the case again. You know, expectations and and trying to break through and and make that college football playoff, recruiting and and everything else that went on last month with with Jimbo Fisher and and Nick Saban. There hasn't been there hasn't been a dull month at all. It's it, we're already into June and the and the season's right around the corner. Why don't we start with that? Because what we've got Andrew on here for first and foremost is his expertise. Is he's going to these camps? He's following recruiting like few others. He's all over it. We will get to that in just a second. But of course, uh, the big talk of the off season, in addition to transfer portal and NIL and expansion and all that business is obviously this little spat between Nick Saban and Jimbo Fisher prior to the uh, SEC coaches meetings in Destin. And then there was an article that came out. I saw it on CBS Sports. It's probably carried in a number of other platforms where uh, Texas A&M had apparently urged the SEC to punish, penalize, discipline Nick Saban whatever term Andrew you want to put on that yeah I think it kind of speaks to you know what obviously what ended up happening was Nick's uh Nick Saban and, and Jimbo Fisher both got reprimands for their uh their respective sound bites and that happened and obviously Jimbo Fisher had the the press conference but I think it speaks to just the anger that was around that building that Thursday morning when, when they kind of learned of the comments and, and Mark Robinson, who's, who's in the um, athletic department kind of called Jimbo Fisher and let him know. Cause Jimbo Fisher, as we talked about last time, isn't on Twitter. And so obviously he's not really going to see the the Twitter comments, but um, got a call about it. And um, there was just a lot of anger that, that about what Nick Saban said, obviously, and, and singling out Texas A&M, but um, went to the, um, SEC meetings, and I know there were plenty of people ready to talk about that at the SEC meetings. And um, both Nick Saban and, and Jimbo Fisher were a lot more uh, toned down at the SEC meetings, and kind of both along the same things that you know we need to find consistency in NIL and um, need to look for solutions. And so, um, you know, I think they they're both trying to kind of move on. They got their reprimands from from Greg Sankey and. Um, you know, both kind of talked about heading towards the future and focusing on finding solutions rather than kind of continuing to engage in that war of words that, that both have had. But but Jimbo Fisher said he certainly had, you know, kind of said his bit and, and was ready to move on. Reminding everyone, once again, we are live talking Texas A&M football. So we have Andrew on all the time talking Texas A&M football. He handled our post game of the Aggies last season, and we've got Andrew on here all the time. We did a spot a couple of weeks ago where Andrew came on the Miami live show, but uh, I thought it would be good to talk some Texas A&M football with Andrew live with all of you and take your comments and questions. So please leave them in the live stream. And uh, Nick, we don't want we to spend a fun, too much lively time on debate this about that, right? I'm sorry. What's that? We had a fun, lively debate. Oh about yeah. That. It was a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Nick, I appreciate uh, what you're letting us know right there. We won't get into YouTube technicalities and so forth, but uh, we hope that everybody's able to access that. So Nick, if you can hit me up at Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, I would love to know what uh, maybe some issues are with uh, the search uh, to, to get some of these streams and the notifications. So uh, we want to make this as easy as possible for everyone to, of course, access uh yes there's mr hd he's a uh miami fan see you september 17th 
at uh, College Station. So everybody go back uh, a couple weeks in the Miami channel and you'll find uh, when Andrew was on, it was a good time having Andrew on the Miami stream. Yeah. Let's get to uh, recruiting. It's been when a busy people think year. recruiting these days, Texas A&M immediately comes to mind because of all the success. Uh, what have you been working on? Yeah, so it's, it's June's kind of a busy month for recruiting because uh, there's a dead period coming up at the end of this month. Um, June 26th, um, take a break for about a month until until July 24th. And then there's kind of a random week where, again, it's kind of a, a – an event or a contact period where players can take visits down to down to campuses again. And then it's a dead period again until the beginning of the season. Um, so it's kind of a last busy stretch here for these, these couple of weeks. And then a lot of camp, a lot of schools around the country are hosting college camps. Texas a and no different um, kind of following a similar structure to what they've had in, in past years where they go Wednesday to Friday, back-to-back weeks, um, one session on Wednesday, two on Thursday, one on Friday, and then um, host a bunch, a bunch of kids. Um, already been some impressive performances from some some young kids. Um, from um, Tori Blaylock is a name that that a lot of fans will probably know, son of an NFL, former NFL player. Um, was kind of the talk of Friday, um, 2025 running back out of Atascacita, had a phenomenal day just coming out of the backfield and, and gave defenders all sorts of problems. Dakias Brinkley is another intriguing guy. I think he started out at linebacker and they moved him to edge um, for the second portion of the camp. And he looked great uh, being able to put his hand in the dirt a little bit. Um, one, one kind of, you know, comparison that was made was if, if he couldn't be maybe a Tyree Johnson for a and fans or remember him um, was pretty good these past couple of years. And so, um, you know, that was kind of the comparison that was made was was if he could be um, – would could kind of turn into a little bit of Tyree Johnson as a speed guy off the edge. Um, probably wasn't as many. There was a couple offers each of the each of the three days. And so um, last year, um, like five-star after five-star seemed to show up. Um, the new noteworthy news of the day on Friday as well, Hakeem Williams, a big uh, target for A&M, a national top 50 wide receiver, showed up on Friday. Um, for an unofficial visit, went through a little bit of a workout and then stayed the weekend. Um, so he was down for the spring game as well. So that's that's a big one for A&M. And um, yeah, it was certainly a busy one. And then this weekend, they rolled right into camps uh, or right into official visit season. Um, Harris Sewell is a big target that was in town. Jaden Chapman um, just touched base with him and we'll have a story coming on the board later today um, over on Gigam 24-7 that um, you know, really enjoyed his trip, got to spend some time with Steve Adazio and um, spent some time with Demetrius Crownover, who's an interesting one, um, moved over to offensive line from tight end. Um, he hosted Jaden Chapman for the weekend, and it sounds like things went went really well there. And um, Andy Jeans, another guy that they had in town that had a really good weekend, a really good time and um, return trip for him as well. And so A&M and Georgia are, are, are very much in the mix as well there. Talking up Texas A&M football right here at the Voice of College Football. We got Andrew Hattersley on here. You can catch his work at Gigum 247 Sports. So it's Gigum 247.com. The baseball team's doing some work too. It's um it's one of the more remarkable stories. You know, last year um AM didn't not only saw their postseason streak come to an end, but didn't even make the SEC tournament. Um, go out and hire Jim Schlossnagel um, and what a job he's done. I think it's probably one of the best coaching jobs in America that he's done with this team to not only get them to the back to the postseason, but they're one of only a couple teams that hasn't lost a game yet in the regionals and super regionals. Um, five and oh so far um, moved on to Omaha in the college world series uh, with a pair of victories over Louisville. And Louisville, should I say, as we were, we, my coworker was giving me business on the other one about pronunciation Louisville. of that. I just blame it on being South African. I just say my pronunciation is different. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it's been a fun time around A&M to the question of, you know, wonder if baseball has an effect on the football side. I think how could it not, right? Like when you talk to kids, um, 
you know, especially having recruiting weekends like they've had the past two weekends. Um, some kids aren't baseball fans, but others that are have had a chance to kind of stand up on the, um, you know, on the on the recreational center, on the recreation center, and overlook the stadium. And you know, one of the things that was said to me was just the fans are nuts. Any chance you get a chance, any chance you get an opportunity to showcase what your fans can do and what sort of environment you can play in. Um, I think can only help recruiting. It can only help the brand of A&M um, show the success that you can have as a program. And so from that angle, I think being able to host games and be able to at least show kids that there's a buzz going around campus and um, a buzz about the team, uh, but just an incredible job. And the other thing I think that's noteworthy, they really haven't even gotten any good starting pitching the past couple of days. And, um, you, you know, and, and really since the second half of the season, and to have won um, several series in a row, uh, be able to beat Louisville without really a starter going more than five innings, just the, what what their bullpen has done is um, is just incredible. And and the timely hitting, I think they were hitting over 500 at one point in the postseason with two outs and runners in scoring position. It's just um, it's just it's just kind of wild. All right. Uh... We've got fan bases from all over the place coming in here, Oregon, yeah. Florida, Alabama, and others, Miami, of course, West Virginia. And uh, so you never know what we're going to get here with all sorts of fan bases being represented. want to remind everyone we've got a Texas A&M channel. So check out most of uh, my work with Andrew over there as Andrew pops on here every week or two to talk Texas A&M football, but please subscribe to our Texas A&M channel. And if you love what we do here at the voice of college football, subscribe, even if you don't like the Aggies to help us to get to a thousand subscribers that helps the deal. And then you can unsubscribe after that. <laughs> All right, Andrew, you've got some picks out there and, and we don't want to unveil the picks here. We want, to direct everybody over to Gigum two four seven to get to get your picks. We don't want to yeah to to rob you of um you know your your views over there, but um just, just give us a bit of a feel because the over under is at eight and a half, and you know what what you were looking at um, obviously the schedule, but also the uh, the personnel additions and subtractions. So um, Brian and I kind of. Um, and for those who I'm sure know, Brian Peroni is our, as also works with me on the on the uh, 24/7 Sports site. We um, we recorded a short little video. I don't know if it's if it's out yet or it's coming out, but um, just kind of giving our season predictions. And he had it at 11 and one, and I had it 10 and two. Um, and I think the pieces are in place to really win there. I think I think A&M feels fine with either Max Johnson or Haynes King at quarterback. I really do. I mean, the, the spring game performance obviously doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, but, you know, they have to remember that Max Johnson had a pretty good year last year. Um, I know it wasn't perfect. I know he takes, you know, his deliveries a little longer, um, but, you know, he, he was pretty, you know, he, he protected the ball for the most part. Um, and I think if you put a strong running game around him, you can certainly win with him. Um, and I think there's tools that Haynes King, he's got to get stronger, obviously, and, and become more durable and get injuries were a concern, obviously, with the hit he took against Colorado. But I think he's a guy that you can certainly win with as well and get out on the perimeter. And um, he's got great speed. He can really make plays with his legs. Um, he's got to just learn how to protect the ball more. Um, but – you know, I think the other thing about it is you still have Devon Achain coming back, um, who I think has a chance to be one of the better running backs in the country this year. And, um, you know, they've stacked good recruiting class on top of good recruiting class on top of good recruiting class. And um, they did lose some players from last year, the DeMarvin Leals and, and Aaron Hansfords, but um, have still got a lot of returning pieces on that on that side of the ball. Um, there's a lot of optimism about McKinley Jackson. He played hurt quite a bit of last year. So I think they're hoping a healthy McKinley Jackson can kind of anchor the middle of the defense. Antonio Johnson's a guy that's now starting to show up on mock drafts and um, can move all over the secondary. Damani Richardson's back. Um, and they've got a lot of talented pieces to, to turn to on the defensive line. I think the key for Texas A&M this year versus last year is returning 
several starters along the offensive line. You got Layden Robinson back. You got Bryce Foster back. You got Ruben Father. You aren't having to almost put together an entire new offensive line. Um, I think left tackle is going to be in a better spot, probably with Trey Zoom there. Um, I think he's he'll be an upgrade over Jameer Johnson. And then you've just got to kind of figure out that that guard spot. And I think it's a challenge. Obviously, Kenyon Green's a big piece to replace. Um, I do think with Evan Stewart in the mix of wide receiver, they can be more explosive in the passing game. Um, and Chris Marshall is another guy that I think um, can certainly be a weapon on the outside and, and um, be dangerous there. And so, um, you know, the pieces have to fall into place. A&M's got a really tough October. Um, that's kind of where I looked at as maybe if they're going to slip up, obviously, the trip to Alabama on October 8th. Well, we talked about this on the Miami stream about um, they've got to go face Arkansas September 24th, then go to Mississippi State, then Alabama, then South Carolina, and home for Ole Miss. That's a um, that's a a pretty tough stretch of games. Yeah, when you think about it, it was Ole Miss and Arkansas, of course, that tagged Texas A&M with losses there in October last year. Um, mm -hmm. The Mississippi State game came down to what? The the last kick of the game, right? Right at the wire. The Mississippi State won. Um, they had a couple turnovers late in the fourth quarter uh, against Mississippi State and Arkansas that – uh, oh, no, the Mississippi State one, they couldn't get a stop on defense. Uh, Ole Miss and Arkansas, they had turnovers in the fourth quarter. And LSU, they weren't able to close it out. Um, late, obviously, gave up the late drive to Max Johnson, actually, um, who had a throw down the sideline late in the game to to score the winning touchdown. But, um, you know, a lot of close games, A&M just didn't finish. And turnovers hurt them. Slow starts at times hurt them in consistency offensively and defensively. And so, um, you know, those were, those were really the, I think the, the problems, but they, they were probably a couple plays here and there from, from, you know, nine and three, 10 and two. Folks check um, out our uh, Texas A&M channel. Once again, uh, if you love the Aggies, obviously subscribe right there. You get a lot of insight from uh, Andrew in particular over on our Texas A&M channel uh, here at the voice of college football. And uh, in addition to that, if you're just supporting what we do in our network of channels, please subscribe. We'd love to get all of them to a thousand. That's a deal where YouTube starts to take you seriously at a thousand subscribers, starts to put the videos in traffic and so forth. Good question by Joey Foster here. Our guy, Joey, yeah. who's asking about the effect of, you know, th this has been the busiest off season I've ever seen in college football. And this is pretty much what it's going to be going forward for the most part. Uh, but that was the one incident that was specific. Everything else is a broad topic, playoff, NIL. This was the one thing that, although it dealt with NIL, were two name brand coaches in this spat back and forth. And can you really tell whether anything's been said by recruits or anything out there where there was any kind of impact? You know, it's interesting because I went to a, uh, a spring game and, you know, we're, we're also conscious. We don't want to put kids on the record about, you know, give us your side, give us your take between Jimbo sure. Fisher and Nick Dave. And that's not fair to them. They're still high school kids, and, and it's yeah. it's a tough spot to put them in. But, uh, you know, a lot of kids actually just approached it with a sense of humor, um, kind of laughed about it, said it was, it was kind of wild what they'd seen from both sides, um, you know, and, and maybe and maybe laugh it off a little bit. The one thing I did – the feedback I did get on the on the Jimbo Fisher um, on the Jimbo Fisher side was the fact that he would stick up for players. You know, from a from a player's perspective, there were a lot of kids that said, you know, him being able to go out and, um, you know, being able to go out there and and put his put out that statement to defend players was something I I know a lot of recruits kind of liked and had respect for. Um, now they didn't necessarily have one to opine on the whole situation, but that was just one piece of feedback that they said that, you know, and, you know, they could, they kind of appreciated that side of it, that he would have their back. Cause he's got the reputation as being a player's coach. He'll coach you hard on the field, but um, is known as a guy that, that players really connect with off the field. And so I think a lot of kids like that and, and just kind of laughed it off on both sides and, and, and tried not to get in the middle of it. Um, just kind of said that, 
you know, Miles McVay was one that that kind of joked, you know, is 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 this the side of you that are you are you what the media says you are, or are you? And Jimbo Fisher said, well, you got to come see me in person. And he said, well, you're not like the media portrays you to be. You're a lot nicer than the media portrays you to be. <laughs> so he kind of joked with them. I mean, all the kids have been having fun with it and kind of joking with them back and forth and and having some fun with it. But yeah, no, for the for the most part, I I don't think any kids have taken it too seriously. He doesn't really have a swing in there. I do think it is going to be interesting though when kids do start going on back to back official visits to A and M and and Ole Miss and and Alabama, how coaches kind of lobby behind the scenes on on those sorts of things. But for the most part, it's it hasn't had too much of an effect. Kind of some off season drama. Web um, security is asking whether you have any type of lean or take on the speculation that the SEC, of course, and Greg Sankey has been very upfront about it, that they worked through a ton of models at the uh, coaches meetings in Destin, Florida in regards to possible internal type playoffs and, and how to deal with that because uh, the commissioner very out front about not being too happy about the playoff proposal being, um, rejected by the other conferences um do you have any thoughts about uh, where this is headed yeah i don't i don't know if it'll end up happening in the future i think it was an interesting idea that was that was proposed around but i think ultimately when if they can get to the table and i did see you know our brandon Mar marcello over at 24 7 um uh, talked about next this time next year wanting to have a a playoff proposal in place to to kind of uh, you know, expand or stay where they are or do whatever they're going to do. And, um, but I think ultimately, I think, I think the AM, I, mean, I think the SEC will, will kind of, um, fall in line with, um, with, with that playoff system as long as it ends up getting expanded. I don't, I, I think it was kind of a proposal that was thrown out there. Um, I don't think they were happy with the way, you know, things kind of fell apart at the end. And and Nick, and Greg Sankey had obviously spent a lot of time putting together that playoff proposal and I think probably expected it to go through. And so for it to kind of fall apart at the end, I think there was certainly some some frustration on his end. But, you know, I, I think in, in the long run, I think they end up kind of falling in line with the with the playoff proposals and, and scheduling accordingly. And, and as they put together their schedule this fall and, and look ahead to Texas and Oklahoma joining. Um, I, I think it was it was an idea that was thrown out there, but I I don't know how seriously I would take it quite yet. Andrew Jim Bo Fisher signed a ten year contract, correct? Last off season, yeah, fully guaranteed. Oh, so they extended him last off season. So correct. was the yeah. original deal ten years? Correct, and then they extended so he's already it back five up to years 10 into years. it, and yeah. now we're back to ten years out. Correct, yes. Yeah. So okay. now nine. So, um, truthfully, I mean, for for questions like this, um, you know, I know David Oni asks how long will A and M keep paying Fisher for mediocre results? He's locked in for the foreseeable future at this point, and so um, you know, I think A and M's certainly put their their faith in him and their trust that. Um, you know, he's going to build, build off this number one, obviously is the pressure going to continue to mount if they don't do something over the next four years? Yeah, probably. Um, but I think they really feel like this is the, the you know, if, I think, it would, I think there'd be a lot more pressure if recruiting was falling off or, you know, they were struggling on the recruiting trail and, but there's a lot of buzz about Texas A&M right now and where they're kind of going and, um, you know, what, what could happen in the next couple of years coming off this number one recruiting class and getting a several other big guys on, on campus. I think for the most part, they like the structure that's in place right now. Ross Bjork is, is happy with where things are going. Um, obviously they want to see the results on the field. Um, there's no question about that. And, and they're, they're paying to compete for championships. And so, um, you know, I think there's, there's kind of an expectation over the next four to five years with the recruiting that, that's gone on the last couple of years that that's going to be the case. Um, but I think right now they're, they're pretty happy with, with, with where they've been. I think they felt like they should have been in the playoff two years ago. Um, so that's something that a &M, you know, administration will bring up, but right now with the way the recruiting's going, I, I think they, I don't think there's a lot of concern about, about the future and where a and is heading. So, Andrew, it was a ridiculous class, of course, in uh, 2022, 29 enrollees. And 
no particular recruit nor recruiting class should be judged after one season. That's obviously their freshmen. They're going to have the least amount of impact as freshmen, but still this, this group is so talented. Yeah. If there's one guy and there, there should be several guys that are going to have an impact. Now let's not put the bar or the standard too high as freshmen that they're going to go off crazy and be all Americans or anything like that. But if there was one guy that you would be the most confident is going to have the biggest impact out of all these, what, nine, five stars? Well, yeah. who would be the guy that you think has the opportunity to make the biggest splash? This year, I think it would be Evan Stewart. Um, I, think, um, I think he is so immensely talented, um, and his athleticism is just off the charts that I think – you know, pretty much from when he got on campus, he's been in the starting lineup at wide receiver. And so um, it doesn't take long for him to get in there. Um, I think his his just explosiveness and athleticism, what he could do, he's he's a, he's a good route runner. Um, he's always working out. I think I, I maybe I get to see that more because I see him in the Dallas area quite a bit. But the guy is always training, um, always working out. And so I don't think you really have to coach up work ethic with him. I don't think you have to coach up um, some of the things that maybe as a freshman, you might have to, you know, kind of deal with learning the playbook and those sorts of things. This guy is a hundred percent bought in. And so if there was a guy that I think has a chance to compete very early on, I think it's, it's probably Evan Stewart down the road. I think Connor Wigman's going to have a huge impact, whether it's, you know, this year, obviously there's, it's Haynes King and Max Johnson. But a year or two from now, I think that's the guy that AM really looks at that can take the cornerback position to another level. Um, he was a tremendous high school football player. Um, you know, and then you've got other guys, I mean, along the defensive line, I think they're going to find a way to play Walter Nolan early and Shamar Stewart and Anthony Lucas, all the, some of those guys that have been on campus early on. Um, but Evan Stewart's probably the guy, I think he's just an elite athlete and, um, is just going to be able to provide something to that wide receiver room that they just frankly haven't had. Um, and I think he showed a little bit of that in the spring game. And, um, you know, I think has a chance to basically be the top option for AM this year at receiver along with Anaya Smith. And so, um, you know, it's rare for a freshman to do that, but I, I think he's got that sort of talent and ceiling. Yeah, so it has to do with the talent, of course, but also the need at the position, talking about wide receiver. Is mm -hmm. that the position either side of the ball that you think has the most question marks and has maybe been the most disappointing the last couple seasons? Yeah, probably that. Um, Linebacker is probably a bit of a concern. I think depth-wise um, would be the other one, I would say. I think the numbers there are a bit low. They need everything to go well at linebacker this year. Um, they need to avoid injuries. Um, you know, a guy like Harold Perkins that they missed out on that went to LSU, that was a huge blow. That was a huge, huge, huge blow. But um, I think receiver has probably been the biggest question just because they haven't had a guy that can take a top off the of defense. Um, they haven't, you know, DeMond Demas was, was supposed to be that guy that would kind of elevate the receiver room. He never got it together. And so um, – you know, I think they're, I think they're really hoping that, and I think they're really excited about all three of these guys that they signed this class. Um, Chris Marshall's a guy who's still learning the wide receiver position, um, but has all the talent in the world. Uh, Noah Thomas is another guy they're really excited about, but I think they, they look at a guy like Evan Stewart and think this is not a guy that we've had on campus yet in, in, in four years under Jimbo Fisher. And, um, that's no disrespect to the guys already on campus, but Evan Stewart's just kind of in that elite group of receivers and, and, and what he's going to be able to do. I, I think, um, I think expectations are sky high and, um, I do think they want to see more out of that position. Talking of Texas A&M football here at the voice of college football. We got Andrew Hattersley on the line as we typically do. You can catch his work at, uh, Gigum two, four, seven. We know he's got, uh, a season prediction out there for the Aggies. Uh, the over-unders at eight and a half uh, and tons of notes from you just had camps over the weekend, more camps, more official week, visits, yeah. unofficial visits. Um, then they've got a big target making a decision on Saturday at Jaden Rashada 
uh, which is, you know, there's there's probably a lot of fans as I'm kind of looking through the comment section here that would that would care about him. Um, you know, he's kind of wrapped up a busy stretch the past couple of days. He went to last week. I mean, the guy the guy has got to be exhausted. Um, he's got a decision date coming up on on uh, Saturday, June 18th. Um, went last weekend. From June 3rd to June 5th, he was at Texas A&M. Then he went to LSU from June 5th to June 7th. Then from June 7th to June 9th, went from LSU to Florida for an official visit and then turned around and was at the uh, OTR 7-on-7 uh, seven seven showcase out in Las Vegas over the weekend. And so now he's probably – these couple of days, he's kind of settling in to uh, to kind of look back and, and make his decision. Um, A&M and Florida are two very – School's very much in the mix there. Um, it's kind of a weird recruitment because both of those schools came into the mix a bit later for him. Um, Florida with the new coaching staff, a and obviously after they lost a commitment from Eli Holstein to Alabama. Um, and Miami and Oregon have been two schools in, in Ole Miss or, or a couple schools that were in the mix there before. Um, Ole Miss has a commitment from Marcel Reed. Um, so that's – they've kind of fallen down a little bit, but – um, you know, a and in Florida and, and LSU is kind of jockeying it out for Dante Moore as well. Um, and so it's, it's, it's going to be a fascinating couple of weeks with the quarterback dominoes and, and where things kind of go from here. Andrew, for somebody who's never been to Kyle field, especially at night, I've been to A&M once, but that was for a baseball regional. So I got a, I got a, just a sliver, you know, the place was packed, but it was a baseball stadium. So whatever that seats, uh, with the, yeah. the the train in the background and the site was it was beautiful and it was a great uh, scene for college baseball, but to transfer that to football, so I've never seen it in person. For anybody that hasn't, can you give us some kind of there? There's always a debate over which venue, whether it's Happy Valley or Death Valley or A and M or best venues and who can really bring it, you know, if you can give us kind of a flavor of what it's like at A&M when it's really rocking. Yeah. So I think, well, for one, they, they, they don't sit down the entire game. That place is, <laughs> that place is rocking. And there's 107,000 in there, regardless of who's playing. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll get a hundred thousand in there, regardless of opponent, regardless of power five. Um, they, they really fill that place up. They live for Saturdays. Um, and frankly, it starts Friday night as well before, um, I know one of the things that, uh, they kind of did recruiting wise last year was bring kids in for, for, for midnight yell, uh, where fans, you know, are loading in for midnight yell at, at 12 o'clock to practice cheers for the next day and, and, you know, have 30 minutes. I mean, I don't have another fan base that is there at, at midnight doing midnight yell practice the night before a, a home game. I mean, that's just the passion and, and excitement around that program. And so, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, they just are into the game the entire time. Like there, there is no, there is no having to get A&M fans into a game. They are into it. They are, they are ready to make noise. Uh, you got the cannon going and, and all that. It's just, it's just a pretty incredible atmosphere when you think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody else with uh, questions or comments there in the chat? Uh, we got Andrew for a couple more minutes. If there's anything else out there, I always love giving, getting player profile. So I'm, I'm going to throw one more at you here. Yeah. We'll grab the 23 class and you went over these guys, but since there's only five hard commits, I'm going to read them all off. You grab whomever you want, whoever you want to talk about, highlight whether that's one, two, five, whatever. So you got the cornerback, Bravion Rogers, uh, number seven at his position. You got Javon Thomas, the other corner, ranked right behind him. Johnny <clears throat> Bowen, defensive lineman, 35th rated at his position out of uh, Texas. And uh, two more Texas guys in Colton Thomason, offensive tackle, and Tyler White, the punter. Yeah, so I'll I'll roll through all of them, um, beginning with Colton Thomas, and I think he's got a he's got a tremendous story. You know, a guy that's really reshaped his body um, and worked incredibly hard. Um, he's been committed to A and M now for close to a year. He took his official visit this 
weekend. Uh, and I think kind of an important development actually with when it comes to him, he's he's picking up playing playing tackle now. He's obviously got the tackle body at six foot eight, three hundred and twenty five pounds, kind of your 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 prototypical offensive tackle. And if there's one trend that's kind of emerged in high school football and in college recruiting, it's getting harder and harder to find offensive tackle bodies, those six, seven, six, 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 eight guys. Like it's just getting harder to find them. And so for AM to have a guy on board that they can develop and work with um, is big because they, they really need offensive tackles. They've got a ton of interior guys, but I, I think a true tackle or a guy with that length and size that they're, able to work with is a huge development. He's, he's a, he's about as locked in as it gets is really doing all he can to help recruit for A&M. Um, and so, um, and just a really good kid too. And then Johnny Bowens, he announced his commitment on Christmas, um, really athletic defensive lineman can kind of play in inside and out um, kind of the, the same sort of the kind of the prototypical defensive lineman that A&M is looking for that they can kind of maneuver around and, um, you know, really, really good player, probably a little underrated out of Converse Judson, um, which produced DeMarvin Leal. I think A&M would, would love to have anything close to DeMarvin Leal production out of um, out of him. So um, just a really good player. And then Javon Thomas is a guy that uh, was not able to um, play for the first part of his junior year, but um, came back shortly before the playoffs and um super dynamic cornerback that can play it, that they've mentioned being able to uh return punts return kicks he played some running back as well in high school Bravion Rogers is a little bit the same way as well um and a guy they've actually discussed a little bit of maybe playing a little bit of wide receiver we'll see how that goes right now he's being recruited as a cornerback and I think that's where he wants to play um number seven cornerback in the country and so um, you know, they kind of got their, their secondary class kicked off in, in April with those two guys on April 12th and 13th, uh, back-to-back days, kind of got a great start to the secondary class. And then Tyler White um, is a baseball player as well, pitcher, um, and a really good punter out of one of the top punters out of, out of South Lake Carroll, which is a big school here in Texas. And so, um, you know, kind of a good start to the class. They're so looking to build more over the next month and a month or so. And, and this, this, this month will be huge when it comes to to kind of putting the class together. And um, one of the big question marks is just what they're going to do at at offensive line, at receivers, another big question. Um, and so I think you'll see that group continue to grow. Our guy Tim's got a question here concerning a former offensive lineman, offensive line coach, Josh Henson, who was at AM. In 2019, 20, and 21, now has moved on to USC. Tim's a big USC fan. Would like to know just your impressions of uh, Henson's work at a and Yes, yeah, so I think um, he kind of had a bit of an up and down go at, at Texas A&M. Um, his first year there wasn't great. Um, the offensive line kind of struggled. I, he really put together a – his best group was kind of his, his veteran group that he had um, – um, with the four with the four seniors um he's a really technical coach um he's 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 big on the technique side um uh, recruits pretty well i think one of the big pieces of feedback that a lot of um recruits kind of bring up with with me about him is is he's a huge on relationships uh players absolutely love playing for him um i know he has head coaching aspirations in the future so that was a big reason you know, a job like USC was was appealing to him that, you know, you can get the offensive coordinator title and, and kind of take another step towards potentially being a head coach. And so, um, you know, I think his biggest strength is just the way he builds relationships with players. Um, you know, he's, he's a, he, his, his, uh, his guys in the run game are, are pretty good at, um, you know, zone schemes and things like that. And so, um you know, weakness, probably at times the offensive line wasn't quite physical enough. I think that was kind of the concern with him. Um, you know, at times they they probably could have played a little more physical and kind of won the line of scrimmage a little more. Um, but, you know, they were able to open up holes and, and be effective in the run game. And and he's a really good recruiter and, and, and 
relationship builder. I mean, guys like Bryce Foster and Ruben Fathery, um, some of the foundational pieces of the offensive line for A&M right now came courtesy of him. And so uh, I think USC fans will enjoy having him. I think he's he was a good pickup for them, and um, we'll do a good job out there. He's, he's, extre- he's extremely experienced. All right, folks, it's been a good time as always. This is our guy, Andrew Hattersley. He takes uh, time out of his uh, – Day here about every week. I track yeah. him down. I bother him <laughs> to come on here and talk. It was Texas a fun time. Was a good, there, were, there were some really good questions in there. Absolutely. We usually record it, folks, but uh, we knew it'd be fun to go live and bring Andrew on here to talk some Texas A&M football. Andrew, I know you got a ton going on, so I always appreciate yes, you coming on here, doing this for us, and uh, hopefully we can get together soon. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, everybody out there, we got our next live stream coming up here at uh, 6 Eastern, so in just about three hours, and it's going to be a different deal. So here's the deal, Andrew. Everybody's always telling me you need to get on this person and this person and this person and this person. So you know what we're going to do? Because some of those are, you know, there's a lot of good guys like you out there that I just hit them up on Twitter, and probably <laughs> 98% of the time people are nice enough to say, yeah, I have no idea who you are, but uh, yeah, you seem like a good guy and have a decent show. Uh, I'll jump on there. But some guys, maybe when you throw out Clat, so you short, you throw people out there like Clat and Herb Street. They're 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 difficult gets. So I said, hey, you guys are uh, talking to our, our viewers. I said, you guys are always throwing out all these people that I should bring on. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a little workshop together. And we're going to do a live stream and I'm going to take this list of all these people that I'm always asked to bring on and work. I'm going to tweet them and all you guys need to jump on because they're going to respond to you. They're not going to respond to me. They're going to respond to, oh, I got 52 likes or 52 retweets or whatever that people really want me to go on this guy's show. So that's what we're going to do. A little workshop, a little different type of live stream tonight at uh, 6 Eastern. Man, people just gotta hit mash that subscribe button, or mash that like button, as I like to say, and hit, hit that get get their attention. That's it. That's what you got to do. So, Andrew, it's always a good time. I appreciate it. Stay cool at these camps. That's not oh, always easy. Yeah, it's it's over hundred degrees, and, and it'll it'll be another hot one. You know what I like to do is is they have the offensive linemen and running backs working inside towards the end of the camp. So I like to just kind of save the the linemen and the running backs for the end of the camp where I can get inside the indoor facility and and kind of cool down a little bit. And Absolutely. still watch those guys. You got to do anything you can. Find a tree somewhere to stand under for just a couple <laughs> seconds. You do anything you can under those kind of circumstances. Send my down. send my tweet, right? Send my tweet from inside the <laughs> from inside the indoor facility and then I can take yeah, a couple I'm minutes. Yeah, I'm not getting good reception there. out here. I need to step inside maybe inside. <laughs> no doubt that's, right, what, that's basically what i do you got me that's that's basically how i do it all right andrew we appreciate you and uh awesome. you have a great rest of your week man thanks you too mark take it easy we'll see everybody back here at six eastern